thank you all for attending this morning. And um, this morning I had an experience that uh, you all probably can relate to, which is that the technology only fails when it absolutely can't. Um, and that happened again this morning. I went to get my presentation at home, and all the computer lines were down. Comcast completely out, and I got this nice recorded voice telling me when I last paid my bill, uh, but I couldn't get in touch with anyone about getting any performance. So, good thing the health records aren't on there. Oh, wait. <laughs> that is, it, did, it did remind me of an example that, I, by the way, I'm Jim Piles with Powers Piles Sutter in Verville, for those of who don't know. Uh, and I've uh, I do know where all the bodies are buried uh, with uh, health information technology. I know why we got here. I was there through the whole process. And I would love to answer any questions you have. But an example I've used in the past uh, is, is one that I think that's illustrative as, as far as the liability, the additional liability that uh, health information technology is bringing. And by the way, someone said yesterday that uh, the um, fraud, uh, was costing upwards of $100 billion in this country. I think the folk, guy from OIG agreed with that. I was just computing yesterday. I hadn't really done this before. I was just computing the cost of health information technology. Uh, under the HIPAA, uh, not, not under HIPAA, but under the American Reinvestment Act, um, which HIPAA was a part of, uh, bonuses, of course, were to be paid for meaningful users of electronic health records, uh, well, you know, a laudable thing to do, um, illustrating that bribes work, uh, because some have observed, some physicians have observed, well, if health information technology was a great idea, we would have been adopting it without uh, bonuses, right? But we have bonuses, as you know, for the first five years, and then, it, then we go to sticks. After that, we go to penalties in reimbursement under Medicare and Medicaid. Um, but anyway, if you look at all of the, you look at what we spent to date since the bonuses started, we spent over $5 billion to get practices and providers, hospitals and doctors to um, uh, add health information technology to their practices. We estimate, CBO estimates will be, we will spend $30 billion uh, before all that's over. That's not counting what the, what the providers spent. Uh, the Parliament Institute, as some of you may know, does uh, surveys on uh, health information technology and its impact on privacy. They, they estimated last year that hospitals alone are incurring costs of uh, annual costs now. Of, uh, they hit $6 billion last year in, re, uh, in privacy, security, and uh, dealing with breaches. So CBO uses a 10-year planning horizon. So $6 billion a year, assume it doesn't go up at all, which it will. But let's assume it doesn't go up at all. That's $60 billion. Uh, additional cost that was not, I know, was not in when Congress originally passed this. That was not anticipated. Uh, so you add the $30 billion in bonuses. So we're up to $100 billion that health IT is going to cost the health industry. Now, that's not to say we necessarily shouldn't do it. Uh, but we need to know the thing that's bothered me, and, and, I, and I, was, I was troubled by this even with the panel that I was on yesterday. It, it, it seems that if you question the value of health information technology or question whether it's as good as some of the promoters have hyped it to be, then you are really sort of viewed as a heretic. I'll tell you the story, a very quick story. I was in the uh, office of a senator, senior senator and a senior staffer right before the High Tech Act passed. And I pointed out to them, I said, you know, AARP and various others say that health information technology will save 100,000 lives a year and $77 billion a year. And many others were making that argument as well. It got to the point where it was just an accepted proposition on the Hill. And I, I pointed out, I said, I actually looked at the studies. I looked at the to Ayers Human Study by Institute of Medicine that the 100,000 lives figure was based on. I looked at the RAND study that the $77 billion in savings was based on. Neither of them said that. Neither of them said, the, the, the Institute of Medicine study did not say you, could, you would save 100,000 lives a year. Uh, the RAND study did not say you'd save 77 billion a year in, with technology. Um, they, uh, the the uh, Institute of Medicine study, for example, was based on, on studies done in 1982 and 1984 in two hospitals. 
of people who had died in those hospitals, and they looked to see how many of them had medical errors sometime during their hospital stay. And they took the percentage who had had medical errors and who had died and concluded they died because of the medical errors. And so several researchers looked at that study after it came out and said, if you buy that premise, then these people would live forever without a medical error. Uh, it's, it's a totally flawed premise. But, uh, and on the, in the round study, compared, they looked to see how much could you uh, possibly uh, estimate could possibly be saved with in, uh, health information technology. And they looked at uh, two, or two or three different industries. They looked at the hotel industry, the banking industry, and the telecommunications industry, all of whom had adopted electronic information systems to see what would the health system industry save. They found that um, the uh, uh, telecommunications industry actually saved some money. They actually saved something that could be used as an estimate of $77 billion. The hotel industry lost money hand over fist, uh, the, uh, and, and they never got a return on equity on, on their investment. Um, and uh, the banking industry also uh, didn't make any real money. I think they barely broke even. So I just ask you, which is the healthcare delivery system more like? Is it more like the hotel industry, or which lost money, or is it more like the telecommunications industry? I suspect it's the latter. But anyway, I was in the office of the senator, and I said, and I showed him these studies. I said, look, these studies don't stand for this proposition. I, I'm not saying we shouldn't do health information technology. I am telling you, though, that you really should go into this with your eyes open, because this is going to cost a ton of money. And she quite literally said to me, uh, you know, you shouldn't say things like that. People think you're crazy. <laughs> so <laughs> I, I tend to tell things like they are. And if anyone doubts what I'm saying, I, I, I tend to also heavily footnote everything. So I invite anyone uh, that questions any of my statements to, to look them up. Now, as I said, what we need is some reality and some sanity in health information technology as we go forward. It is creating, it really is creating a privacy crisis. I mean, it is, and, and the thing that I find shocking is that there's very little interest in the part of either the Bush administration or the Obama administration to, to really address the crisis. It cannot be denied that, that now that we know we have reported breaches since 2005 of 60 million people. That's, um, and, and if you look, as I have, if you look at the responses from the public once when these articles appear in the paper, people are really pissed off about, about this. They are, and every time there is a privacy breach, there was a study just released yesterday by Poneman. They found that 83% that of the people who have had a breach will not use that provider again. And so it's not just, privacy is not just a good legal issue. It's not just uh, good medical ethics. It's good business. And the, the study that I, I referred to yesterday, the American National Standards Study, was a fascinating study to engage in because we involved uh, some of the biggest technology companies in the country in that. We worked on it for a year, as I said. And what they c concluded at the end of a year's worth of study of what's happened to the health information uh, industry since uh, HIPAA was that uh, there are unprecedented privacy breaches going on, but also unprecedented threats, business threats, to those who are using electronic health information technology. And the, and the money that's ha having to be spent on security uh, and responding to breaches was never anticipated. And it's, I mean, it's, it's huge. I mean, the thing I just chuckle at sometimes, um, I, sometimes I go to these uh, uh, health information technology uh, uh, seminars or, or conventions, and I literally seen a room, 350, 400 people in it, all security experts. Now, those people didn't weren't in that business prior to 1996, and they're all being paid by the same health care dollars that we, that we have to spend on treating people. So whatever you think about electronic health information technology, it's going to be a very expensive proposition. It is going to uh, result in, in some increased capabilities of you know, analyzing trends and that sort of thing. Uh, 
but it is going to cost a heck of a lot, and the money that it costs is money that is not going to be going to treating people uh, and providing uh, care. We have a health care delivery system that we cannot afford. It will be bankrupt in 12 years if everything goes well. Uh, if everything does not go well, it will be bankrupt a lot sooner than that. So um, the, the question I have, and, and what I do wonder about sometimes, is why are we pushing ahead so hard on this at a time when we don't have the money um, and, um, and when we have not solved the privacy issue? Because as Great Britain found out, if you don't address the privacy issue, the public will reject it, which they did in Great Britain. Britain had to write off billions of pounds, whatever that is. Uh, they had to write off, and, and they finally just had to scrap the whole idea of an interoperable electronic information system. Now, they may come back to it at some point, but it was extremely unpopular with the public because the, they, they knew the privacy protections were not in there. And when you're breaching the privacy of Americans at a rate of, you know, an average rate of about uh, two or three million a shot, uh, that, it's like little bombs going off all over the country. Uh, so. Um, Somebody's going to have to address this, and, and what's going? And the thing, I, I work in the political world, I work in the business world, I work in the legal world, I work in the clinical world, and so I get to see a cross section of things. And I can tell you that when you get enough of the public ticked off about something, then it becomes a political issue, and we're pretty close to that right now. Congress sees the headlines, members of Congress see it, and they understand HIPAA is totally inadequate uh, because. And, and, you know, I, again, I've worked on this issue for since before we had HIPAA, and, and there's only last week I finally realized something. Maybe others are smarter about this than I was. I never realized this before. But, you know, under HIPAA, you can disclose, use and disclose information for treatment, payment, and healthcare operations without consent. Without, and you don't have to tell the individual. You can just, and, and even if they object, you can use it anyway. Um, so uh, there's, no, there's no process by which an individual can object. Um, and you can also disclose information to a business associate without permission, as long as you have a business associate agreement. What I didn't understand and didn't, didn't sink into me was that it is up to the covered any entity to decide what is a, uh, a, a treatment or payment or health care operation. I mean, there are 78. If you look at those regulations, there are 78 different categories that come under those headings. Uh, but what I, and, and, and I should have realized this because my clients are always calling me saying, Jim, we want to do this. How do we fit it under uh, one of the exemptions so we don't have to get patient permission? And I, and, I, and I found myself saying, oh, well, you could describe it as a healthcare operation here. I mean, well, for example, the, the company recently, the unfortunate company that wound up in the headlines that used health information to collect debts, past due amounts from people in emergency rooms. <laughs> uh, that caused huge uproar on the Hill, huge backlash in the press. And I looked at it and I thought, what? That's permitted by, by HIPAA, expressly permitted as healthcare operations. Bill collection is one of the things you can use someone's health information for with, uh, against their will. You can do that. Why is this a big issue? It's a big issue because the public didn't understand it before that, and they understood, but many, a lot of them understand it now, and Congress didn't understand it either, and that's why they held a hearing on it, and they were shocked to hear that's permitted under, uh, under HIPAA. So I don't, I don't know, I thought that was uh, kind of, it, well, it does illustrate another thing. There are some things, I, and my clients, I also deal with this a lot with my clients, is they come to me and say, Jim, is this legal? And I say, yes or no, whatever. But if I say yes, I say, well, that's the legal answer. Now the question is, what's the business answer? For example, I have clients, I've had clients call me, Jim, we had this X, Y, and Z happen. Is that a breach? And I carefully parse the de definition of a breach in the statute, and I say, no, it wasn't a breach. Good news, you don't have to notify anyone under the law. But you might want to think about doing it, because if this leaks out to the press, Blue Cross Blue Shield lost 10 million records and didn't notify a soul. That's not good. That's not good for business. And as the Palmen study says that was released uh, yesterday, 83% of the people won't 
won't you? Well, lose their trust in you. I, I also uh, was intrigued by a statement by Lou Gerstner. Some of you may remember him. He turned IBM around. IBM was really in the doldrums years ago, and he absolutely was a complete turnaround artist. Turned them around, and on his retirement in December of I can't remember what year it was, he stood up and he said, "There's one thing we've learned about technology." He says it changed a lot of the rules of commerce. But the one rule it didn't change is if your customers don't trust you, they don't buy from you. So it's just a basic business principle. And nowhere is that more true than when you're dealing with health information. One last thing before I get into my presentation. I, I was intrigued yesterday when I saw um, a professor uh, from uh, Louisville University, the uh, I'm blocking his name now. Uh, but great guy, really brilliant guy in the area of ethics and privacy. And um, he was able to quote, uh, when the lady from the ACLU talk, gave a quote, he was able to, to figure out where that quote came from. It came from uh, Brandeis in his Olmstead decision. One of the things, by the way, is interesting, uh, maybe interesting to you as well, is re remember when someone yesterday said that some of the ideas I had were old? And I, I got a chuckle. I thought about that more overnight. And I was remembering Brandeis' fav famous quote uh, that um, privacy is the right to be let alone was in, an, in a dissenting opinion. It was in a dissenting opinion. It was not the prevailing view at the time the decision was issued. But 20 years later, it became the prevailing view. And I think what that illustrates is laws are nothing more than public opinion and public expectations. That's what they are. And that's what professional ethics are as well. So it seems to me that if we're going to be smart about health information technology, you should look at the, at the public expectations uh, and the public desires as expressed in traditional standards of ethics and traditional laws. But anyway, uh, I was, it, it reminded me of uh, a quote, and, and I'm just going to read through it quickly. It's a little bit long, and I'll, I'll tell you a little something about it. It says, the internal effects of a mutable policy that are, more, uh, are, are still more calamitous. It poisons the blessings of liberty itself. It will be of little avail to the people that the laws are made by men of their own choice. If the laws are be so voluminous that they cannot be read or so incoherent they can't be understood, uh, if they be repealed or revised before they're promulgated or undergo such incessant changes that no man who knows what the law is today can guess what it will be tomorrow. Law is defined to be the rule of action, but how can that, how can that be a rule which is little known and less fixed? That's the problem we found with the HIPAA privacy rules. I'm a lawyer. I spend 80% of my time working with these rules, and I don't know what they mean. The, the right to privacy under those rules is different, varies depending on the size of the organization. Your obligations under that as a, as a regulated entity change if you are a hospital versus a solo practitioner, which means that the, that the rights that the patient has vary. They're not the same for a physician as they are for a hospital. Um, this quote was James Madison from the... Uh, uh, from the, uh, the Federalist Papers. And old, old sentiment. Still true, I think. Um, and uh, OK, anyway, I'll, uh, enough of that. Let's get in. Um, so um, why should we care uh, whether uh, um, we have a, a right to privacy? And uh, th this, I thought, and this is why I read the statement yesterday to the representative from HHS, because uh, this is a statement that's about, oh, what, uh, three months old? Uh, Americans have cherished our privacy from the birth of our nation. We assure ourselves protection against unlawful intrusion into our home, our personal papers. I think the lady who appeared yesterday works for this guy. Um, and uh, the observation, citizens who feel protected from misuse of their personal information feel free to engage in commerce, participate in the political process, or seek needed health care. This is the cover letter to the Consumer Data Bill of Rights issued by the White House in February of this year. Uh, and then he really gets to the nitty gritty. Never has privacy been more important than today. In the age of the internet, World Wide Web, smartphones. So it's incumbent upon us to do what we have done throughout history, apply our timeless privacy values to new technologies and circumstances of our times. So that struck me as being a little different from, oh, that's old. We don't do that anymore. Um, so I don't know. I, it, I do think 
the president is right. Yeah, and he happens to be a former constitutional law professor at University of Chicago. So um, I'm somewhat comforted by the fact that he still reads the Constitution. A further extract from his letter, uh, one of the key values, or perhaps one of the key values which our society is built more than in and itself. Oh, actually, this is, an H this is HHS's findings when they issued the original privacy rule. Also necessary for the efficient uh, delivery of health care. See, that, that's the thing that I find interesting is there's somehow this notion <coughs> that privacy is in conflict with quality health care. It isn't. It is, and the Supreme Court has held this repeatedly. The privacy is essential for quality health care, and HHS found that when they issued the uh, original HIPAA privacy rule, which, by the way, that rule was the result of the largest rulemaking ever by HHS. They had more comments for that rule than they've ever had before or since. Um, and in, in an incredibly scintillating statement, this was the clearest statement I've ever seen a federal agency issue. Uh, and I was just I'm, I'm amazed by it when I think when you think about it. In short, the entire healthcare delivery system is built upon the willingness of individuals to share the most intimate details of their lives with their healthcare providers. That was what I was saying yesterday. The whole system failed. We don't have health information technology. We don't have a healthcare delivery system. We don't have anything. If you're not willing to tell your provider the truth about what's hurting you, about what's troubling you. If you can't tell your psychiatrist what's bothering you, you will go shoot nine or ten or however many people at Virginia Tech. You will do that. We've got to preserve your trust if we're going to have a healthcare delivery system. That has to happen. More, that's more important than uh, selling widgets to uh, Ireland, which is covered by the uh, Consumer Bill of Rights. The Consumer Bill of Rights I found quite interesting was it sets forth all these wonderful principles, very general principles that the president said. But then buried over on page 27 of the, uh, of the document, it says, oh, it doesn't apply to HIPAA. So now what we have, this is, you're probably some of the first people to understand this. What we have now is, under this administration, is we have strong privacy, a strong privacy bill of rights and protections for non-health information, which everyone agrees is not as sensitive. Then we have for healthcare information, which is everybody agrees is in, in terribly sensitive. So I would, that's why uh, we, Deb asked me uh, uh, to, to work on this set of, uh, yeah, sure. Um, actually, um, why do you think they've made this exception for HIPAA? Oh, well, I know the answer to that. Uh, and the question is why they wouldn't make it an exception for HIPAA. Um, because they didn't adopt that consumer bill of rights out of the goodness of their heart. Remember what I said yesterday, the answer is money, now what's the question? Um, the, the reason they did this is because the European Union in October or December, I believe, uh, issued a sweeping data privacy regulation uh, that, to be signed by all the European nations. And that uh, uh, regulation set forth very strict privacy standards, including control, gave the individual control of the disclosure of their information, and it applies to health information. It definitely includes health information. Europe has always been a little stronger, at least in recent years, been stronger on privacy because they have an unfortunate history of what happens when you don't. Uh, and, um, and they also said in that regulation, any nation that does not have privacy protections that are as strong can't deal with the European Union. So we were in danger, this country was in danger of be, having all of our commerce with the European Union cut off if we didn't adopt strict, quickly adopt uh, data privacy standards that were comparable to what the EU had. And also the Asia Pacific Alliance has privacy standards also that are very similar to the uh, EU standards. So we were, we were becoming isolated in the world uh, economically. Uh, and so interestingly enough, the, the Data Privacy Consumer Bill of Rights did not come out of HHS. They came out of the Commerce Department. So, uh, so the Commerce Department, uh, Cam Carey is the head over there who was in charge of this, is uh, Senator Carey's brother who I've worked with in the past. He sent all this over to the White House and someone in the White House, I don't know if it was the President or whoever, but wrote this wonderful sweeping letter uh, 
uh, about how privacy is a continuing right in this country and a, one of our founding principles and has it and we need it now more than ever in the past and without ever consulting with, at least as far as I can tell, without ever consulting with HHS. But somebody at the last minute said, oh God, wait a minute, we got it. We all what you're doing here, this privacy bill of rights is far, has far more privacy protections in it than HIPAA does. So they stuck a sentence or two in there that says, oh, it doesn't apply to HIPAA. Uh, things that are regulated by HIPAA. Now that really is a problem because there are some there are uses and disclosures that uh, that that HIPAA might not apply to. For example, what if there is something that is not a breach under HIPAA, so it, HIPAA doesn't apply to it, uh, but it, it, it would you'd have to disclose it under the Consumer Privacy Bill of Rights. <laughs> No, we have a real mess. So I think one of two things is going to have, have to happen. The Commerce Department is either going to have to withdraw their Consumer Data Bill of Rights, and we all and the, uh, America gets cut off from the EU, <laughs> or we're going to have to change HIPAA. And that's why I think you are really hearing this at a very propitious time, because I think uh, coming forward with a health privacy bill of rights at this point is, uh, and the timing is really good, because it, it builds, it simply builds on the, the EU, the Asia Pacific principles, uh, and now the US's principles. The only thing that's out of step with that is HIPAA. So HIPAA is really out of step with international privacy protection. It's also out of step with the uh, standards of professional ethics as well. Um, and again, certainly raise your hand and jump in if you'd like. Um, why do we care what consumers want? As I say, we the whole system depends on consumers. If you're in this business, if you're a practitioner, if you're a technician, whatever you are, you're all you all all of your businesses depends on on the consumer having trust in you and being willing to buy from you or whoever uh, the company that you're providing information to. Um, so um, so. Um, why should those who handle uh, health information, health healthcare, um, you know, um, care whether uh, uh, consumers have privacy rights? Well, because you can be sued, for one thing. I mean, in, assuming you don't want to do the right thing, uh, assuming that you don't really care what your reputation with your customers is, you can be sued under tort law in this country for breach of privacy under all in all 50 states in the District of Columbia. Uh, now, the courts have been pretty... Um, uh, uh, they've been pretty uh, rigid about requiring some showing of damages. And sometimes it's hard to show damages when your health information is, uh, is lost or your privacy is breached. Uh, but increasingly folks are finding that that damage is fairly apparent, uh, like the TRICARE breach, uh, that I'm not disclosing any confidences here, the TRICARE breach has been in all the newspapers, 4.9 million records. They had eight class action lawsuits filed against them. Uh, very quickly, and at least one of them that I saw had a lot of damage listed by some of those people who were included, um, and including use the use of their health uh, num uh, health insurance number to get health insurance for people who were not, you know, covered by Tricare. Um, th it was a real eye opener for me to uh, work with the technology companies and the security companies working on that American National Standards Program because our report. Because what I found is that organized crime is massively moving away from financial uh, data theft. It is massively moving into health data theft. Because if you can steal like 4.9 million uh, insurance numbers, as it was the case in the Tricare case, and then you can, you can sell that stuff on the black market at about 50 bucks a pot for each number, that's a lot of money. And then there's cloning. I didn't heard about cloning before. As, as some of the security experts were telling me about in, in a down economy, we often find families where only one person in the family may have insurance and the others do not, and they may need something, and they need health care. So what they do is they just pose as their other family member. Uh, so it's, it's, a, you know, it's, a, it's not an unintentional fraud. It's an intentional fraud uh, on the people, by the people who own the insurance numbers. So... Um, the folks at ID experts, I think, as a matter of fact, are coming up with a uh, system to try to prevent that from happening. But um, um, so, um, 
Right, is health information privacy. I, I get this a lot, and you know the thing I just find amazing because I, I, as I say, I went through all the debates on the high tech, um, on the HIPAA and the law statute and the regs and the high tech statute, and now the regs coming up. And I remember I was in a meeting with the senior staff for the Ways and Means Committee, and we were looking at the draft of the High Tech Act, and I said, you know, guys, you you got some nice stuff in here, but you you have this entire section at the end called privacy. And you don't, and you define every term, every key term, but you don't define the word privacy. Don't you think you ought to do that? I mean, the, the public would like to know what privacy it is that, that you're protecting, and the regulated industry would like to know what what is their, what are you, they expected to do? What is it that they're supposed to keep private, you know, and, and how are they supposed to do it? And I will, I'll see if I can clean this up. They said, uh, we would probably act it up, uh, and therefore we won't touch it. Uh, so um, you, you cannot believe how frightened people on the Hill are of the word privacy. They're scared to death of it because most of the lobbying money goes to uh, expanding technology. Uh, there's very little lobbying money on the Hill for protecting the right to privacy. So. Um, uh, it, it will only take it'll, it'll take a public out, outcry or backlash by the public, I think, to get Congress motivated. But that is occurring. That is now occurring. I think we'll probably see some stronger privacy protections. Um, but but HIPAA, the HIPAA privacy rule, when you consider that it only applies to three types of covered entities and their business associates, um, that now, as I say. It's up to the covered entities to say who is a business associate, and it's up to the covered entities to say what is treatment, payment, or healthcare operations. Uh, but it does not cover, for example, what happens if you have a law firm that subpoenas health records from a hospital? They're not doing something on behalf of the hospitals. They're not a covered entity. Uh, they're not. Uh, or they're not a business associate. Rather, they're not a covered entity. And what if the information then all gets stolen? HIPAA doesn't apply, uh, and that, that we have a case like that. Uh, so there are lots of the, the privacy protections in HIPAA do not run with the information. They apply to only certain types of folks who handle it. So that's that. There are lots of gaps. Um, but anyway, I, I, at some point we're going to have to define privacy, and I, Justice Brandeis's uh, definition I think is probably not a bad one. I thought. Um, Again, what was the discussion yesterday about uh, privacy is really autonomy. That, that really is what the first ten amendments of the Constitution are all about, if you look at them. They're really about autonomy and the, keeping the government out of your life uh, in certain ways. Um, and, and privacy is really the right to, uh, it's not an absolute right, of course, but, but it is a right that's pretty well embedded in our culture and in our constitutional form of uh, government. Um, these are quotes, the other two uh, uh, examples here are quotes from the preamble to the original HIPAA privacy rule, which had a right of consent in it. Few experiences are as fundamental to liberty and autonomy as uh, maintaining control over when and how and whom and where you disclose your information. Individuals' right to control the acquisition, uses, and disclosures of his or her identifiable information. That's, that's what health information privacy is supposed to be. That was the National Committee on Vital and Health Statistics in June 22, 2006. So, also, if you look at the case law, which I have, I've litigated a lot of cases in this area, the courts are pretty clear on this. They understand what privacy is. Control is the key term. Privacy is your ability to control the use and disclosure of your information. If you don't have control, you don't have privacy. You don't have a right to privacy. It's just that simple. This all came, as a, way, a matter of fact, is interesting, because uh, 1977, we had the Whalen versus Roe decision, where the Supreme Court, for the first time, found that there is a right to privacy uh, in the uh, amendments to the Constitution. Prior to that, Justice Douglas had, had alluded to it in the, the Griswold case in 1965. Um, but um, as we, as we then uh, roll forward to 1980, there was a Third Circuit decision involving Westinghouse uh, versus OSHA. And uh, a Court of Appeals judge in that case really set forth what is the operative uh, definition of privacy, which is privacy is the right to control the disclosure of your information. <clears throat> now, again, it's not absolute, but we know from from the history and experience of the country that if you don't recognize someone's right to privacy, 
you're in, you're probably not going to have quality health care because people simply will they they will self help. They will not disclose the information that starts out private. It's all in their head or in their body. And if you don't convince folks that their information will be kept private, they won't disclose it. So I think we'll have a definition of privacy before long. Yeah, this is the these are the sort of the background. Uh, um, and <laughs> again, I was. Uh, I thought that I found the old comment interesting. Uh, Griswold, of course, is an old case, so, but this is what uh, Douglas had to say, that uh, the right to privacy is older than the Bill of Rights, older than our political parties, older than our school systems. Um, it really is, and it's embedded in English law, of course. And also, health privacy is embedded in the uh, standards of professional ethics, which go back to the 5th century BC uh, under Hippocrates. Uh, but recently, I, I, I found the decision in U.S. versus Jones issued by the Supreme Court in, what, February of this year? That was a fascinating decision. did not involve health care, health uh, information, but it did involve information collected electronically. The uh, police force in D.C. got a warrant uh, to put a tracking device on a, drug de a known drug dealer's uh, SUV. The warrant was for 10 days, and it was for D.C. They attached this vehicle on the 11th day in Maryland. And so clearly it was not under the warrant. So the question was, uh, could they put a tracking, an electronic tracking device on an individual and collect continuous information about where that in individual went? And to my total astonishment, a unanimous Supreme Court said, no, you can't do that. I was shocked by that. Now there was a uh, there was a majority there was a majority opinion and a concurring opinion. It was five four. The majority opinion, um, written by uh, gee I think it was Scalia, wrote the uh, majority opinion, uh, said that uh, or Kennedy I can't remember which. But anyway, they, he said that uh, we we really must look to the reasonable expectation of the individual. Do Americans believe that as they drive around in their cars, they have a reasonable expectation that someone's not going to spy on them continuously? The answer to that was yes. Yes, they did. And you can, sure, you can watch someone drive around. They could have attacked, they could have had deputies or deck detectives follow this guy around and observe his car. But you can't put an electronic device on it. That, that bothered the Supreme Court. That's a, that's a Fourth Amendment uh, that's an unreasonable search and seizure. Uh, the the concurring opinion said, "Oh, um, oh, I'm sorry, I got to have that backwards." The the, uh, the the majority said, "No, we will look at to original intent." That's right. We looked to original intent. They looked to original intent. So at the time the Fourth Amendment was drafted, this would have been even even in that day and age, it would have been viewed as a, as a violation. The concurring opinion said, oh, we need, need to look not only at what was originally intended, but we also need to look at what did they have a, re a current reasonable expectation of privacy. And Justice Sotomayor wrote a separate concurring opinion, which I, I, I thought was really fascinating. And I thought she was quite enlightened about what she said. She said, you know, we cannot assume today that simply we have a, there is a lot of convenience involved in disclosing information uh, to online today. But people don't necessarily intend, if they disclose the information for one purpose, they don't necessarily mean to disclose it for all purposes. And she says the court is going to have to grapple with that. So wh what you're seeing with the development of health information technology is you're seeing the law playing catch up. The law is always behind. You know, it takes a while to, for Congress to hear about problems and pass laws. It takes a while for cases to be brought. But the law will catch up. I mean, it will. It'll always be behind. But it'll do. And and I, and what you're going to see is you're going to see an increasingly ticked off public, which will lead to an increasingly involved Congress, which will lead to increasing laws, and which will lead to increasing liability. Now, the the reason I thought coming up with a set of privacy principles was important is. We need to be able to conduct commerce in this country. We need to be competitive globally. Um, but we also need to protect what's necessary for quality health care. So um, it seemed if you could, nobody, the public doesn't understand the law, the regulated industry doesn't understand the law, hopelessly complicated. So I thought if we could come up with a set of five, you know, 10 or 11 privacy principles that, uh, that would be easy for the public to understand and easy for the regulated industry to, to apply, you heard 
the lady from the government yesterday saying, oh, well, you know, HIPAA is just a floor. You can always do something beyond that. But if you do that, you get penalized because HIPAA also says if you, if you have as a privacy practice something in addition to what HIPAA requires and you don't do it, that's a violation of HIPAA. So no self-respecting lawyer is going to tell his client to put in a consent process when one is not required by HIPAA. I mean, why would you do that? I mean, you could say something like, we will endeavor to get your consent, but, but HIPAA is inconsistent with standards of professional ethics, uh, and the reason it is, the explanation for that, we brought that point up when the HIPAA rule, uh, the amendment to the HIPAA rule uh, was uh, implemented, and the response was, oh, it, it's, not, it's just a floor, it's not, it's not even a best practice standard, but it has become both the floor and the ceiling, and it's become the best practice, it has become the actual practice standard. So the very defense that HHS made for uh, uh, eliminating the right of consent um, is, is just no longer true. I mean, people are just, it has become the de facto uh, privacy principles of the country. Um, I'm, uh, if you look also at the um, Privacy Act of 1974, and one of my son's teachers says, all, all, all history is a continuum. Uh, and if you, you, you realize why we have the Privacy Act of 1974, because it was right after the Nixon debacle when uh, White House plumbers broke into the psychoanalyst office of Daniel Ellsberg who was going to publish the Pentagon, was trying to publish the Pentagon Papers, broke into his office uh, and stole his psycho psychiatric records in an effort to try to discredit him. Um, if the White House plumbers were going to do that today, they wouldn't use a crowbar, they'd use a computer. Uh, and that's, that, that's possible. Uh, but what we got the year after that was the Privacy Act, which says as a congressional finding, the right to privacy is a personal and fundamental right protected by the Constitution of the United States. That was congressional determination. HHS has made the same determination in issuing the original HIPAA privacy rule, which had a right of consent. Um, but uh, uh, so you, you see that Congress reacts to things that happen uh, out, in the, uh, out in the workplace. Tort law, here is the restatement of torts. Uh, that uh, will be applied to you if you breach uh, someone's privacy. Uh, well, this is this is what the track here people and the um, well and also re remember the the tragic case of the the student uh, from Rutgers University. His roommate spied on him. He was he, he was uh, a homosexual and he uh, jumped off the George Washington Bridge. He was convicted for breach of privacy. Now the guy did the uh, the spying. Uh, and so this is a concept that we in this country, we have a right to privacy and you can be sued if you violate it. Now again, the question is what are the damages? Sometimes those are hard to prove, but that's recognized in all 50 states and D.C. There is also a psychotherapist patient privilege uh, that was recognized in the, by the Supreme Court in Jaffe versus Redmond in 1996. That was the same year HIPAA was enacted. Um, that applies in, uh, in all, at the federal level, and in all, in all 50 states, it turn, turns out, have a psychotherapist patient privilege, and D.C. does as well. Now, under HIPAA, every covered entity is supposed to issue a privacy notice, and it's supposed to describe the privacy practices of the, of the organization, and also describe the privacy rights of individuals. Now, that's not limited to the privacy rights of individuals under HIPAA. It's the privacy rights of individual generally. So there is not a privacy notice in this country that I am aware of, and certainly not even the ones issued by the federal government, that lets people know that they have a right to privacy under the Supreme Court case law. Yes? Yes, boy, um, riveting. What happened to her? Yep. This is the psychiatric uh, yeah. information? Yeah, right. Well, this seems, based on what you presented, it's contrary to what is actually going on as it relates to privacy breaches. Right. So I, I'm having a hard time. If, we're, if the country is moving toward electronic health records, 
then why isn't the privacy issue and the security aspect of this data a priority? <laughs> That's a question I have. Uh, I think it will erupt. I think you're going to have something like the, uh, well, here's my prediction. I think that one, the reason it isn't is because the public is only gradually becoming aware of the problem. Therefore, Congress is only gradually becoming aware of the problem. But where you're going to have, where, where the Liz is going to get ripped off is when we have an election that is determined based on someone's medical record. And it will. It's only a matter of time before a politician's mental health records or substance abuse records or something get disclosed. Uh, and people will say, how could that have happened? And you'll see something like the Privacy Act of 1974. You'll see, you're going to see a political opponent uh, reveal someone's records. Very quickly, in some years ago, I did a hypothetical. Uh, some of you may remember Senator Frist, who was a physician from Tennessee. He um, uh, was in support of eliminating the right to... Uh, privacy uh, for uh, under under electronic health information records so he uh, and he and he wrote a, an op-ed where some uh, someone's life was saved they went to the emergency room they were unconscious and their electronic record showed that you know what they were on and all the drugs and everything and so they were their life was saved so I wrote a hypothetical as well and I was also published about a hypothetical senator from Tennessee who had political aspirations to be president and uh, that um, uh, this um, hypothetical pre uh, pre uh, candidate was visited one day by three representatives of the insurance industry and they said gave him a list of things they wanted him to do politically and he said that's outrageous I can't do that get out of my office and they said well before you throw us out you all know, know that we have access to your medical records and we did notice that that period after college when you were a little depressed you actually com considered committing suicide um, so you might Want to think that over before you uh, not don't do what we ask you to do. Uh, he said, outrageous. He throws, throws him out of his office anyway because he's a principled guy. Uh, calls his attorneys, tells them to look, block those guys, you know, keep those guys from publishing. And two days later, he's contacted by the Washington Post. She says, we have a story here. We're about ready to run about you considering suicide when you graduated from college. Just want to know if you have any comments on that. Sues to block the Washington Post from publishing the story. And the court said, I'd love to help you, but the Supreme Court in 2001 issued a decision in Bartnicki versus Vopper, which says that the media has a First Amendment right to publish anything, even if it's obtained unlawfully, if, as long as it's about a public individual. So you can't block the publication of that information. So his political uh, uh, aspirations are destroyed. He goes back to Tennessee. One day, uh, the wife of a former patient calls him, tells him that, that the patient's died of a massive heart attack. And he said, well, what? what, what? And she said, he'd been having chest pains for weeks, you know, and, um, but he just didn't want to come in. And he said, well, why not? Well, he said, you know, that a downturn in the economy. He's afraid he'd get laid off from his company. And so, you know, he just died for lack of uh, coming in, getting good health care. So the, the point of the article was privacy is, is good government. It's good medicine. Uh, it's good law. Uh, it's good politics. Um, it's good economically. Uh, as I said, you know, the story I also tells sometimes is about Lee Iacocca. Remember uh, when he decided uh, early on that um, he fought seat belt, uh, shoulder harnesses and seat belts forever in uh, Chrysler automobiles. Suddenly he figured out that safety sells and did a complete about face and then became the champion for seat belts and shoulder harnesses and Chrysler sales went through the roof. Same with privacy. Privacy sells. And, uh, uh, and now what I am sensing is that big companies, hospitals, doctors, offices, technology companies are beginning to understand that privacy sells. Uh, other sources here are, um, by the way, it should be a number one priority. If you assume that the transaction of you being willing to voluntarily disclose the most intimate details about your life, if you assume that is the crux, that is the relationship the whole healthcare delivery system is based on, Privacy ought to be the number one priority. If you instead say, okay, we're going to figure out what privacy uh, uh, regulations we should have. We're going to invite everybody into the room who has the remotest interest in this issue. And we're going to have a big stakeholder meeting. And we're then going to come up with a set of regulations. That gets you the HIPAA privacy rule. 
because that's exactly what was done. And the technology companies, the insurance companies, the bill collectors, God knows what, all had a much louder voice than the consumers. That's what happens when you do not prioritize. That's what happens when you don't have a principled approach. And that's what we're suggesting. Um, yes, good question. Now, how do you view um, the situation that the younger generation uh, is putting up there all their details about the lives on Facebook, on Twitter, or right. whatever? And I mean, it's not comparable to your medical data or whatever, but um, in discussion with my kids, I, mean, I, I really sense a difference in, in opinion on privacy. So um, do you view that how did it play out in eventual new regulation? Yeah, and that's why it's so important to not go I in the other direction. It's, 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 it's important to not disclose someone's information without asking them. It's equally important to not fail to disclose someone's information without, ask without asking them. You just need to ask. That's what we're talking about. And that's what, uh, if you look, for example, I think the Obama administration would have been shocked a year ago if you had said, the public isn't going to like it if you require them to have health insurance. And they would have said, what are you talking about? Everybody needs health insurance. If everybody has access, I mean, what, what could be wrong with that? The problem is Americans don't like to be pushed. They really don't. This whole country was founded on autonomy. And even though it may, I, I bet you that 98% of the people who are opposed to the, the mandate, the health man, individual mandate, would get health care if they had the opportunity, but they just don't want to have to do it. They don't want the government telling them they have to do it. They don't want the nanny state, which, you know, it just is what it is. Uh, so I think the right to privacy is not, is, is not the non-disclosure of information. The right to privacy is your, you know, your right to decide. So if your kids want to disclose everything, uh, fine, do it. But also, if, they, if there's something they don't want to disclose, that's fine too. Sometimes I say, you know, everybody, nearly everybody would be willing to disclose nearly everything. But nearly everyone has something they don't want to disclose. And I can tell you, I've had this experience. If you have a child who has a problem that you don't want to see follow them the rest of their lives and, and be available to everybody in their health records, I tell you, that, that's a, <laughs> you'll do what it takes to keep it out of there. And my clients, my physician clients, lie all the time. They keep stuff out of the records. They, they call it something else. That's just a standard medical practice. Now, most doctors won't tell you that. And they tell their lawyers that. Yeah. I'm just wondering why more of the patient privacy advocacy groups aren't after this regulatory problem. Because it does sound like chase the money, that's the promotion right. of HIT, right. but you're not going to fix the privacy problem until you get to the root, which is the regulatory problem. So yeah, that, we well, it is, and that's why, again, I, I thought arguing for a principled approach and building on the Consumer uh, Data Privacy Bill of Rights from the, the just was issued by the White House is a good idea. One of the things, if you're interested in doing this, ask your members of Congress, take that Bill of Rights, ask them, which one do you oppose? Is it control? You don't want people to have control of their information? Is it transparency? You don't like that one? Is it accountability? Is it that? Which one do you want to throw out? And I, you won't get a single taker. And what I've found is very interesting about this whole process that I've been through now since the last 15 years is <clears throat> we are where we are today because of secrecy, because uh, there has not been a public debate on this. And uh, the public doesn't know. For example, the public thinks, when well, you think when you sign that HIPAA privacy notice that you're somehow getting privacy rights. You're not. That's just a notice of what HIPAA does. If you don't sign it, it doesn't make any difference. Your information is gone, disclosed, without your knowledge, with or without your signature. It's, it's, just, it's just to let you know what's, what's going to happen. And it's not very good at that. Yeah. Okay. Right. Well, HIPAA, the HIPAA statute is very short. It's like just a couple of paragraphs, but all of the standards and everything are in the HIPAA privacy rule and security rule. 
Uh, and as I say, that it's wrong in both directions because it doesn't inspire trust in the public and it's hopelessly complicated and the regulated industry can't comply with it. Every, what we're finding is every time there's a privacy breach and OCR goes in and does an audit, they find all sorts of violations. Of course they do because no one can comply with all these things. Blue Cross of Tennessee uh, lost uh, a, a couple of discs with, a, with a, several million people's names on it. And they went in and, and, and found that they had vacated a building. They had left all their computer stuff in a computer closet with a biometric lock on it. You had to have, stick your thumb on there to get that lock to open. But they were found in violation of HIPAA because they didn't station a guard at the door of the, of the suite. Oh, really? I mean, is that required too? I mean, it's, so it's, I, you, you'll see that every, every investigation of a breach will find a violation because the laws are so complex. They are. The fines are, are, are quite substantial, but I mean there there are gaps, and and then there, it's hard to do, to do some of the investigations. The, the lady, I wanted, one of the things I wanted to get back to the, the heartbreaking story about that lady yesterday, which I thought was absolutely riveting. I, but, but the thing to remember about that was that that the reason she got no satisfaction was the thing that she objected to was precisely permitted by HIPAA. That's why OCR couldn't help her. Because it's true that psychotherapy notes can't be disclosed without authorization. But if your facility requires those notes to be included in the general medical record, that, can, that loses the psychotherapy notes protection. The patient has, is nowhere involved in that decision. So a doctor or, some, or the, the uh, facility can put the information in the general medical record and the additional protection for psychotherapy notes is lost. Then that information is disclosed, all 200 uh, pages of it is disclosed to every practitioner. All perfectly permitted by HIPAA, HIPAA privacy rule. See, that sort of kind of thing, I think, is just going to, it's going to have to stop. Let me just get right uh, quickly through the rest of this here. Uh, I just wanted you to see some of the privacy rights uh, under HIPAA that individuals have to be notified of. And this is a list of those. We'll, we'll also give you, make those available online. Uh, but there are other privacy rights that, you're, that HIPAA doesn't require patients to have notice of, such as the additional uh, privacy rights for psychotherapy notes. The disclosures of uh, the, the minimum necessary principle uh, is that only the minimum necessary amount of information is to be disclosed. If you look in the preamble, the preamble says what that means is, because we went round and round with CMS on that, what this means is that that is to be interpreted in a way that is consistent with and does not override professional standards. That's great. That's a great way to get professional standards somehow bootstrapped into HIPAA. Uh, and what it says, and this is the question I raised, which, HIPAA, uh, which uh, HHS responded to, I said, okay, only minimum necessary is supposed to be disclosed, but who decides? Is it the, is it the insurance company? The insurance company always requests everything. Is it the practitioner? Is it the patient? Who decides? They said, it's the practitioner, because the, he or she is the gatekeeper. So that's good, because under the current definition of minimum necessary, it's supposed to be consistent with professional standards, and it is uh, the decision is made by the entity that is subject to those professional standards. So that's good. But CM, uh, HHS is about to issue a new reg regulation redefining minimum necessary. Last question. Yes. Yeah. Well, I think another problem is psychotherapy notes and the way it's defined in HIPAA is very, very limited. It is. It is quite limited. It excludes in quite a number of things. Right. Yeah. Um, so. Um, this, this was, I, as I say, I just love this reaction. HHS hates for me to bring this back up. But uh, when, I, when I said, hey, you're, you're eliminating the right of consent when it's, uh, when it's required by the professional ethics of every segment of the medical profession, how can you do that? And they said, oh, well, you know, this is just a floor. It's not supposed to really not even be best practices. So here we are today. They said this back in, what was it, 2002, I think. So here we are with the standard practice in this country not even being best practices for privacy under electronic information systems. They don't like to hear that. Um, so these are the standards, uh, privacy standards uh, contained in the AMA's standards of professional ethics. The AMA has been 
squirreling around with this for years. It's still pretty strong. I represent the American Psychoanalytic Association. Theirs is a pretty good standard, I think. Confidentiality is uh, the patient's communication, the basic patient right. That's consistent with history. Um, and but uh, these are the th these are the privacy rights that the HIPAA privacy rule does not require the patient to be notified of. You don't have to tell them that they have a constitutional right to privacy. You don't have to tell them they have a right to privacy under tort law. You don't have to tell them about the psychotherapist patient privilege, minimum necessary, right to privacy under standards of ethics. Uh, there is, under, under the High Tech Act, we got this in there, uh, provision that said if you pay out of pocket, uh, you can, you are, and you request restrictions on the disclosure of your information, it cannot be disclosed for payment or healthcare operations. It can still be disclosed without your knowledge and consent for treatment. We got that specifically in the statute. Uh, and then we have the privacy crisis. You would think that we would have stronger privacy protections when we have hundreds of thousands of disclosures, plus we see now that health IT, we shouldn't be in an almighty hurry to implement this because health IT, as I say, the, the early studies show it's not going to save that much money and it's not going to save many lives. And this is the cost. Um, Lots of money, as I mentioned, it's about a hundred, about a hundred billion dollars, and the privacy breaches are just going through the ceiling. I'll tell you one thing: they are. I, I wondered at the time why, when when the High Tech Act was enacted, uh, they, the administration could have put it in the stimulus bill, which was the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act, or they could have put it in the Health Reform Bill, which was coming later. I thought at the time, isn't health IT part of reform? Why did they put it in that? Then it hit me: it doesn't save money can't put it there because then it would have been a deficit it would have made the uh, health reform bill uh, go into more deficit so essentially the health the the high-tech bill is is a jobs bill and it has created a lot of jobs that that it has done um, so as I said uh, you know uh, I, I somebody asked me to to if I could describe what health IT has been and it's really the nuclear energy of health reform it has the potential for some benefit uh, long term, but it has the current potential for great devastation and permanent devastation if you don't control it. So uh, it is all of that. Um, realistic benefit, it does have some bit of care coordination conceivably will be better with uh, being able to figure out where, what care people have been getting, cost reduction through saving sharing, that's possible. So there's the policy question. Do you shape your fundamental rights and your professional ethics to meet the, tech, the capabilities of the technology? Or do you shape the technology to fit the ethical standards and the fundamental rights? I think it should be the second. But we'll see where it goes. You're, uh, you're, you're coming along at a time where the ride is still going on. Thanks very much for coming. I'd like to chat with you.